Excellent. Well, let's start with a round of uh, introductions uh, here. So that's the third panel uh, that we've got in our series. And we've got a whole, well, we're not short of questions. Um, we were uh, anticipating uh, Tanya to join us from South Africa, but uh, unfortunately uh, in her area overnight, she informed us they've got a power outage that's now happening exactly at this time. So uh, she won't join us, but she's, re uh, she's recorded uh, related material that uh, she'll make available and I'm sure we'll meet her on a, a future panel. So as a way of introduction, uh, uh, I think you'll probably have seen me somewhere on the Autistic Collaboration uh, Trust website. So I tend to write uh, mainly um, about uh, well, this topic and, and other topics uh, related to uh, autistic collaboration. Um, I'm not an expert on ABA, I'm here as a facilitator and well, I can offer otherwise just autistic uh, lived experience. Um, Kim, do you wanna briefly talk about where you're coming from? All right, uh, my name is Kim Crawley. Uh, I am a cybersecurity writer and researcher. I currently work for a company called Hack the Box. Uh, I'm 37 years old now. I was diagnosed with autism and ADHD at age 34 after a childhood and adolescence and young adulthood almost getting diagnosed with things and then being prevented from diagnosis. So it was suspected that I was autistic since I was a toddler, but I didn't get formally diagnosed until I was 34. And learning more and more about how neurodivergent people get abused and about how the vast majority of the so-called treatment for us is, is, is abuse and it doesn't help us and it just traumatizes us. And to not trust anything that people who aren't autistic say about autism, because frankly, it's all bullshit. It, like all of this and like the history of abuse and conversion therapy behind ABA and all that, it's, it, it's so disgusting. And I'm willing to fight and to use my relative position of power to be very vocal against how autistic children and young adults are being abused now. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Um, Star, it would be great to hear a little introduction about you. I mean, I think we've communicated with each other uh, for a whole number of years. And uh, I mean, I recall uh, coming across uh, your big book uh, many years ago, and that was such a delight to, to read. So uh, uh, introduce yourself to the audience and, and the people who are gonna listen to this. Sure, so I'll have video on <clears throat> just for a minute here because um, I'm on satellite, so the bandwidth is, is small, so you could just sort of see me for a second. But turn off to be save on bandwidth a little bit. So I was diagnosed as an adult. The reaction was to find other people like me. So I found that odd treat and went to that for a few years in a row while that was still happening in the United States. I started a support group, first one in my state, and um, wrote that book. And then my next big project was a Autistic Run Retreat Center, where I am now, which is why I'm on satellite, on top of a mountain. And um, <clears throat> so that retreat center is in progress. And uh, I won't say, I guess I don't need to waste time saying any more about that. But um, also, I'll just say a tiny, I won't say anything about it, but I'll just sort of raise the topic of social media and the way that autistic people are organized these days has been very marginalizing for me because I can't 
effectively communicate and contribute in that realm. Um, so I felt like before social media took over, I, I was fairly active and was thinking of myself more in an activist. And now I just am not any of that. So that's all for me. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much. And I think this is, I think the last thing you said is, is a very important uh, message that of course, these days, uh, a lot of um, activism is related or, or happens on social media. And this is just not uh, something that um, some or, or perhaps many autistic people can sustain. I, I know this from myself. I mean, I, I am uh, active on, on, on Twitter to, to some extent, but it's it's painful to to be forced to interact on that type of platform um, because it's uh, as far as I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm concerned it's it's well, it's the opposite of the the way that i uh, would usually uh, well, want to engage with people um, and the only way that works for me is uh, well i just uh, only um, interact with people that I can relate to and I just cut out any anything else um, and um, but still yeah these platforms are, are not made uh, for us and it's I think it's one of the ways uh, in which society shows us how, how little we are appreciated and our, our, how little our, our needs are, are recognized. Um, so to, to start off here with these questions that we've got, uh, I, I thought uh, perhaps a good question here to, to start is um, to ask uh, where are we at globally in terms of banning conversion therapies and, and where do we have good examples to, to point to? Um, and as a way of introduction, um, what's got me uh, thinking and, and, and sort of now what basically triggered this series of panel discussions and also the uh, related uh, petition we're running here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that I noticed last year in a very positive way that more and more uh, jurisdictions um, have uh, talked about and are now starting to enact uh, legislation against conversion therapies uh, for gender non-conforming uh, people. And I found that to be extremely encouraging. And, and, and so this made me think, yeah, the, the timing is right to do something about this. Um, and so I think those are the examples that I'm looking towards uh, and well uh, in the process of starting this petition here in New Zealand I looked around to discover uh, a few petitions that I could find easily on the internet in other jurisdictions now also uh, towards banning um, conversion therapies or, or ABA as it's mostly uh, called for autistic people. Um, and since our petition went live, which is, what is it, maybe a month ago or something like that, um, I've noticed uh, further petitions have sprung up. So I, I think we are at the beginning of uh, the autistic community now recognizing that perhaps this is the time to uh, become more vocal and, and very visible. Uh, about uh, uh, where we stand and how it relates to these bans on uh, other forms of conversion therapy that are already active and being enacted. So Kim and Star, all back to, to you. Uh, what are your thoughts? You're on mute. I'm very, very happy to hear about gay 
and trans conversion therapy being banned in Canada. Unfortunately, our politicians, our supposedly leftist politicians, declare we have banned conversion therapy, as in that that's it, all conversion ther therapy has been banned, like as if the government paying for ABA is in conversion therapy. So it's very, very upsetting. I know a lot of autistic people are gay and a lot of autistic people are trans, but to just say that banning gay and trans conversion conversion therapy in general is banned is infuriating, infuriating. And like our, our, our supposedly leftist politicians in the NDP, the New Democratic Party in Canada, supporting funding for ABA and like shouting from the rooftops, like congratulations, we banned conversion therapy. It's just the most angering thing to me. So I'm very, very happy for the gay community and the trans community when their conversion therapy gets banned. But too many gay rights organizations and transgender rights organizations are completely unaware that ABA is conversion therapy. And we get, we get left in the dust, even by organizations that exist purely to ban conversion therapy. All, like a number of the Twitter accounts that have usernames like stop conversion therapy and stuff like that. They completely ignore that ABA exists and that autistic children are subjected to it. So I'm just really pissed off. Um, may I say something now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm so one of my biggest points of confusion about this is that there's two historical trends that are both happening at the same time, and I don't know which one is more powerful or more, you know, indicative of the future. And so one of the trends is the one that everyone talks about, which is that, you know, a long time ago we had institutions where there were just rows of beds where all of the people who society throws away go and basically just get fed, but otherwise ignored. So there's the sense of advancement. There's a sense of civil rights uh, moving forward. Um, the United States and many other countries have um, gay marriage. And so that's like a sort of a theoretic, that's like a, an ideological viewpoint that I think is partly true, but is partly false. Because the other thing that's happening is that the industries that take care of different people, um, whether it's disabled elderly children, teaching summer camps, you know, just the whole range of, of, our, of the sector of our economy that, that takes care of people is carving out more and more exceptions to people who are not acceptable. So it used to be that more people's just way of being was okay. And now there's just more and more labels and more and more types of therapy and more, more and more like basically more conversion therapy. So I, my fear is that that second sort of ideological historical trend is the more powerful one and that we are actually losing the battle even though there's certain cases where you know we did get marriage equality and we got a few things like there's civil rights things that have happened, but I think we may be losing overall. So I'd like to know what everyone else thinks about that. That's I think a very interesting observation, and it uh, relates to what uh, I uh, often refer to as the hypernormalization in our society that is where well, I, I think I agree with you. The, the, the trend so far has been um, increasing hypernormalization. So the, um, the, the growth in, uh, well, unspoken uh, 
what you could almost call them standards that people are supposed to conform to. It's just, uh, we can look at, at Western industrialized culture, right? I mean, there is only one acceptable life path for all humans in, in the society. And that starts, uh, well, you're born, then there is an entire education system mapped out for you uh, with very little choices uh, usually then you're expected to uh, get a so-called job. And then when you're no longer useful, when, then you, society basically retires you. Uh, and um, I think uh, this, I find that uh, is a concerning symptom of, uh, of the kind of society we, we find ourselves in. And uh, increasingly, I think anyone who, uh, well, diverges from this very standardized path um, is pathologized. And uh, to, to perhaps uh, yeah, elaborate a bit more, especially the, the, the world of jobs is, is hyper uh, normalized. I mean, yes, it's, it's like in a supermarket, there are choices, but you have to basically pick one of those cookie cutter uh, choices. Um, and then uh, society dictates what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Um, and that I think makes life uh, very hard, if not unbearable for increasing numbers of people. Kim, what do you think about this, this broader framing? Uh, sorry, the, can, you, can you repeat what the broader framing is? Um, well, that we live in this hyper normalized uh, society where uh, the uh, expectation of conforming to one, uh, one, the one standard acceptable life path is the only option that's available to people. Oh, like the you go to public school and you you graduate high school or whatever the equivalent is in your country and then you go to college and university and you get your degree and then you go on to get a career with that degree yeah it does fail neurodivergent people i dropped out of school when i was just 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 before i turned 16 like the earliest i could do so legally because it i wasn't diagnosed with anything when I was in public school and I tried, I tried so hard. And all the bullying and being, you know, being given horrible grades once I was in the Gifford program and everything, all the, all the ableist components of the public education system in Canada, which is probably similar to other countries in the West. It was just, it was just brutal for me. I had to leave and I, I was very lucky. I'm in a position now that you would normally need like a bachelor's or a master's degree to get into. Like I, I'm a cybersecurity researcher. I'm a tech company blogger. I write books about cybersecurity. I never graduated high school and I never formally went to college or university. So to this day, the, the extent of my formal education is grade 10, which is what they call 10th grade in the United States. I don't know what the equivalent is in the UK or in other countries, but that like my formal education stopped when I was 15, pretty much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, I eventually became successful, right? Is a, is a total fluke. It's a total fluke. Like I was incredibly lucky. I spent the entirety of my teens and my 20s and my early 30s deep in poverty. And it wasn't until my cybersecurity writing and research took off that I was saved. Like I make very good money now, but it was like a total lucky accident. Like the system is not supposed to work like that. You're supposed to get like a master's degree to get the kind of career that I have now. But there are so many, there are way more autistic people and people with other neurodivergencies who will fall 
through the cracks than there are people like me who has like lightning strike them and, oh, you're successful now. Mm -hmm. And I truly do believe that my professional success, yes, I did work very hard. Yes, I am talented, but luck is 90% of it, 90% of it. Because you're otherwise you're not supposed to succeed if you don't get a university degree or you don't have rich parents funding you. That's basically it. Yeah, and and perhaps uh, we just need to explain to non-autistic viewers or, or, or listeners here why uh, this hypernormalization is so toxic and un well unbearable or unsurvivable for autistic people in particular, because I think uh, many people in the Western world experience extreme levels of cognitive dissonance. Uh, and they, uh, so they, they feel unwell, they feel under immense pressure. Um, I, the distinguishing factor I think with autistic people is that we simply, well, we can't maintain that cognitive dissonance. And so we have mental needs, we have physical needs, uh, we have social needs, and uh, we can't suppress those needs uh, to the same extent as neuronormative people. Um, and that gets us into trouble with the system much earlier than, than most people. Um, so, and that I think, relates to our cognitive processing, to our level of sensitivity. So in, in many ways, we are very attuned to, to what we need uh, and, and what works for, for humans. Um, so in my case, for example, uh, yeah, spoken language it, it, uh, is not really my, my, my first language. I mean, I, uh, I think, in these conceptual models and semantic links. And um, I remember for, from a very young age, I mean, I was attracted to mathematical formalisms because uh, this allowed me to, and, and so, the, and to the foundations of mathematics, not the numerical stuff. And, um, and if you, read about human cognition, well, we, we think in terms of metaphors. And so the spoken language is a serialization format that is a bit foreign, I think, at least to, to some of us. Um, and so I was lucky academically because, well, in the academic subjects, uh, that wasn't really a, a challenge for me. And then I just kept quiet and uh, so that worked. Uh, but I was never interested in getting any kind of credentials. So yeah, I, in my case, I did go to university and I studied uh, mathematics for quite a number of years, but I didn't get a master's degree or anything. I mean, I embarked on these things, but then there was, when I started to feel pressure to do certain things that I didn't relate to, I just said, well, this is enough. I mean, I don't need this. Um, and I mean, I now consider talk about myself as a knowledge archaeologist because this is what I've become an expert in. Um, uh, that taking in information, asking questions, and then surfacing knowledge or shared understanding. And because this is something that seems to, well, in our deceptive Western ideology and culture, this is something that has fallen between the, the cracks. People are actually in the professional world, most of the time, they're, they're not really working together. They're working, they're competing against each other. Uh, but uh, society pretends that that's not the case, that everything is just uh, nice and well. Um, and yeah, so, and this, now brings us back to the topic of conversion therapy, because uh, society, I think, pressures us into these, uh, this very, uh, yeah, strange and 
inhumane level of standardization, this game of pretending. Um, so, and I guess now coming back to the, the question, where are we at in terms of banning conversion therapy? So on the one hand side, as we just saw, things are, I think, getting worse. Uh, and, but if we look at the, also if we look at the bans that I've been able to find uh, on the internet, this at the moment, uh, I'm aware of the, the, the bans that uh, have been enacted or that are in progress in the Anglosphere. And in all the same countries, we can now see uh, visible movements uh, towards banning ABA for autistic people. But I think what I'd like to explore also in this series of panel discussions, and we won't get to the bottom of that, that of course, in, in this panel here, because I think we all, we all live in the Anglosphere, is the, the rest of the world is a bit unknown, I think, from most of our perspectives. So uh, if anyone here can point us collectively in the direction of uh, sources as to what's going on in other jurisdictions in other countries, that would be much um, appreciated. Um, I don't have information on non-English speaking countries, but a small point I want to make about that is that when I read things about autism from the UK versus stuff from the United States, the tone and effectiveness is so different because, and I think that the reason is that the money flow is very different. Um, so in the UK, they sort of do things because they're considered what needs to be done and then you find funding for it. Whereas in the US it's, you, you find a market and then you, you're an entrepreneur and you, <clears throat> then you like go into ABA because of the money. And then the money falls. Um, <clears throat> so it, it changes um, the tone quite a bit between those two countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this commercialization of, of ABA in particular it seems to be something that yeah, has, has really taken off in the United States. And I mean, there, I mean, what's, and I've been writing a couple of articles where I have these links to uh, this, or what I refer to as the autism industry. It, it really shows it's seen as a business opportunity, as an investment opportunity, as something to make uh, millions of dollars uh, by, uh, uh, convincing um, parents that their, their children need to be uh, well, treated. Um, so, but I think uh, from what I have seen um, internationally from talking to a few people, some of which hopefully we'll uh, get uh, to, to hear from in, in future panels, in, in I think other countries, for example, in Asia, it seems that, or I suspect, and also having visited some of those countries, I suspect that there the um, pressure for conformance uh, on autistic people comes from a slightly different angle. So this is maybe important to understand. So in the Anglosphere and the Western world, I think one of the main challenges that we face is that, um, well, this, continuous need to uh, promote ourselves or as, as you know as a professional uh, the, to sell ourselves. I mean this is just completely unnatural for autistic people and that's ultimately what disables us completely in, in this society. Um, whereas uh, from the bits and pieces that I've heard uh, from uh, autistic people in Asia, I suspect the main thrust there may simply be um, 
well, the, the rigid norms within those societies. Uh, so, because in, in some ways in these Asian cultures where there's, uh, well, not, there isn't this demand to sell yourself, there is eye contact doesn't have the, the same significance or, or is even not, not appreciated in, in the Western sense. So there are some aspects where you could say, oh, this is actually could be really nice for autistic people. But I think then in other aspects of life, uh, there is still this enormous uh, conformance pressure. And I, I think it's for well, the, the economic system there, of course, uh, the global economic system exerts additional pressure. So that I guess what I'm trying to say here is in different places, autistic people run into these conformance, into different types of conformance constraints. And in all cases, this is challenging. And uh, so from what I am sta I'm starting to understand is that in even in these Asian countries, well, some of these Western techniques like ABA are starting to take hold with respect to autistic people, but the motivation for applying these things may be slightly different. The really shocking thing though is that um, it seems that people in Asian countries are often, but well, they feel, seem to feel unsafe even to articulate the dark side of, of ABA. Um, so uh, that means globally, autistic people currently are in a, in a very bad uh, place. Um, and so here in New Zealand, we are having uh, discussions amongst activists uh, about how to successfully, uh, well, uh, ramp up a campaign against conversion therapy in a systematic way. And one of the topics that uh, we've, uh, that has come up here, and I think also in, in online discussions uh, internationally is, this question of how do we shut down derailing arguments about new forms of ABA? I mean, the rebranding in terms of positive behavior support that's already out there. And uh, in the future, I think we may expect, you know, the same, what well, similar uh, approaches coming up under new labels, uh, where all these approaches really, they serve the established ABA practitioners who don't want to stop and not the, the people who are on the receiving end of uh, what's, what is being practiced. Uh, so I'm keen to hear what, what, what your thoughts are on, on this topic. Well, I think that the framing it in terms of conversion therapy is one of the best things and that is really captured my interest when you first um, put it in those terms. And I think another term that could be used is colonization, uh, just because that's kind of a, a, a global catchphrase among activists in the English speaking world and, and you know all over. Um, where, um, but there's colonization of like land and territory and killing people like genocide, but there's also sort of colonization of the mind, uh, which is part of that. And that also was done a lot to indigenous people. Um, but I think the type of colonization of the mind that's happening now is it's almost just another way of saying conversion therapy, but it's like the practice of either workplaces or schools giving people sort of no autonomy or leeway in how they do things and telling them they have to use a certain kind of pen, a certain kind of paper, they have to write a certain kind of way. Um, and it's just about performative looking a certain way, right? Like rather than actually learning something or completing your job. Um, so banning conversion therapy and colonization are terms that can kind of get around ABA just saying, well, it's not ABA, it's something new, but it's really still is all of those things. OK. 
Tim? Yeah, um, I, I hate it when people act all surprised, like how dare you call ABA conversion therapy? The only conversion therapy that happens is toward gay people or trans people. And they're like, they're totally ignorant about the history of Ivor Lovis and how he invented both. And um, one of my friends in the Toronto, Canada community uh, who was, who's younger than me and who was abused by ABA as a child um, tweeted today that they wanted to uh, Zoom bomb uh, a session between like ABA practitioners with footage from the Judge Ruttenberg Center. And I, I liked that tweet and I thought, yeah, that's, that's great. And then I thought, if ABA practitioners, like most of the ones who punish and reward by taking a child's favorite things away and only giving them back to them when they've behaved in some totally horrible way, um, they're just, you know, they look at, they look at people being electrocuted at the Judge Rotenberg Center and they're just gonna say, well, we don't do that. We, there's no, there's, you're not making a point here. We, we play with the kids, it's interactive, it benefits them, you know? Like I, as an independent adult, like imagine if I had to beg and plead and do something bizarre just to like get a beverage or get, you know, get a piece of toast in the morning or get to lay down in bed and watch TV or read a book. If I had to perform for every single thing that I do every day for comfort and for amusement and for rest and my, my human rights to having those things. And, and like autistic children, especially if they're under ABA, they're not supposed to, you know, be able to have free will and to, you know, pour themselves a cup of orange juice if they feel like it. They have to, no, no cup of orange juice until you've proven yourself worthy of it. And like a lot of autistic children are nonverbal or partially nonverbal and to withhold their alternative forms of communication, like to withhold um, AAC from them unless they behave. Like you are take, you are literally taking their voice away from them unless they behave. And like the vast majority of ABA practitioners endorse that kind of bullshit. Like show that you're worthy of a communication medium. Like Okay, we're all adults here. Fuck them. Like seriously, fuck them. I am so glad. So I used to think that my life would have been a lot better if I was diagnosed with autism as a child. But now you, you come to the dark realization that I'm actually better off having been assumed to have been a, a bright kid neurotypical when I was a kid. Because I, even though ABA wasn't really a thing in Canada in the 80s and the 90s, there would have been some other abusive practice that I would have been subjected to. I endured a lot of abuse in the public school system and society. But I imagine if I had an autism diagnosis, it would have been worse. And like the very concept of diagnosis is totally bizarre and fucked up because we don't expect uh, homosexuality and being transgender have both been in the DSM and the other diagnostic manuals at other times in very recent history. So it used to be a thing like being diagnosed as homosexual. But in 2021, the idea of needing a diagnosis to be confirmed as homosexual is just bizarre. If you're homosexual, you will figure that out, right? 
you know if you're homosexual. Like the idea that you need some sort of medical expert to, to decide that you're homosexual. And the vast majority of people these days would agree that that's absolutely bizarre. So why, why with autism? Why? We know if we're autistic, we know if we're ADHD or if we're neurodivergent in some other way. Why do we need this so-called expert to tell us that we are or to deny us of that identity if we don't fit some sort of rigid arbitrary criteria? It, it's just it's just infuriating. I'm hoping that you know by the time I'm in my 50s or older, the whole idea of being diagnosed as autistic won't be a thing anymore. People will, they'll just be, it'll just be understood that people will know that they're autistic, just like they'll know if they're homosexual or heterosexual or bisexual. Um, I think that this whole, uh, well, the fact that uh, there is this, well, the, the established uh, forces that, that benefit from the current arrangement that they uh, work with this concept of diagnosis and then promote uh, you know things like diagnostic services this it's 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 part of uh, well this colonization of the mind where it's about getting everyone including autistic people and their parents to uh, accept arbitrary authority. And, and in fact, I mean, the, the parents tend to be already sort of indoctrinated in this idea. And so this belief in arbitrary authority is so deeply ingrained that people feel compelled, well, uh, yeah, we must have a diagnosis here from the so-called authority. Uh, the irony is that, of course, all forms of lived autistic experience in this context are sort of brushed under the carpet or deemed irrelevant. Uh, that's so dehumanizing in itself. Um, and just, uh, yeah, I, I think the history, however, is is very interesting with Ivar Lovas, right? I mean, what I think we in our campaigns really need to emphasize and repeat again and again is that Ivar Lovas started working with autistic people. So this is where all these ideas uh, in their modern form come from. It started with autistic people. Only then did Ivar Lovas and, and his collaborators start focusing on uh, gender non-conforming uh, children, and it's worthwhile perhaps to for for the general audience to point out that well, where did that come from? Well, that came from people with from parents with strong religious convictions who had been indoctrinated in certain ideologies who were concerned about their children, and uh, this is where. Ivar Lovas and others then jumped on the bandwagon because they, that's what gave them funding for their research. And this goes back to the 1970s. Um, and uh, luckily, of course, the, the uh, gay rights movement and the you know, all these LGBTQ and so forth communities have made huge progress so that now uh, we are seeing progress in that area, but uh, all throughout uh, the, the same kind of techniques or equivalent techniques continue to be used on, on autistic children. And in fact, as I think uh, more of these uh, so-called uh, therapists uh, or, or professionals, uh, as the mark, their market, in quotes, is drying up in, in one corner, uh, it's uh, so well, effectively a logical conclusion probably for, the, for some of them now to, to focus on autistic children, which uh, they still consider to uh, be a market. And they talk about that even in this uh, context because it's an industry, it's a profit-making industry. It's not about uh, assisting uh, autistic people. Um, and so I've been thinking about how we can uh, 
yeah, assist those people that are caught up in the industry. So um, I think with, well, we could hope perhaps that some professionals also experience some level of cognitive dissonance about what they're doing. But I mean, those who've been at this for years, uh, they perhaps lack some level of sensitivity. I mean, otherwise they wouldn't be doing this. But uh, I think there, in terms of a campaign, it may be worthwhile focusing on the parents because as we discussed at the beginning, I think many people, regardless as to whether they're neonormative uh, or autistic, they suffer from this cognitive dissonance as to what our society expects of people. So, and you can hear this in parents when they say things like, ah, oh, well, life is not fair. And uh, basically children have to get used to that and they have to learn how to deal with that. Um, so, so this is where this sort of comes through. And if we can uh, find ways of encouraging parents to uh, admit to those things and to start seeing that perhaps autistic people, well, they are simply hypersensitive in many ways and they can see things that are wrong in our society that uh, other people simply don't dare to point out. There's a, another um, angle that might be helpful is suicide risk. Because um, one of my <clears throat> jobs once, once a week is suicide counseling for teenagers. And there's a very clear correlation from the case from the people that I talk to that the more clamped down their, their families are, the more hyper normalized they are, to use your terms. Um, the more likely the teenagers are going to actually commit suicide. So it's just an impossible angle. Okay. And, and what about the others? Um, I think it'd be okay to hear from everyone, wouldn't it? Yeah, if, if uh, so, that's right. I mean, if people here would like to uh, talk and contribute, you're, you're welcome to. Um, so I know uh, we've got some people here who are listening in who may want to contribute to further panels, but uh, I mean, if you are comfortable contributing here and now, please, please do so by all means. So just uh, raise your hand or uh, unmute yourself. Um, um, may I just circle back to a comment that I think Jorn made um, early on, uh, which, or actually it might have been one of the other early speakers, um, uh, about the fact that even what you would have thought of as progressive political parties in Canada, like the NDP, are so solidly in favor of the ABA industry. I feel very betrayed by that. Um, I've gotten so betrayed by leftist parties in this country that I have, I'm not a member of any of them, <laughs> just so that my positionality is clear-ish. Uh, um, so I would love it if somehow we could try to figure out, diagnose why that is, that they're so invested in pushing for the ABA industry. Um, and I think it has everything to do with capitalism and the fact that the NDP is really not an anti-capitalist party. If it ever was, it certainly isn't in 2021. And they are so, you know, into all the money that's associated with it that they just can't see the wood for the trees or refuse, I think. And you know, maybe one of the reasons why it's so hard to get a ban on autistic conversion therapy as compared to an LGBTQ one, which is maybe two thirds achieved in Parliament. Um, maybe it has to do with the fact that to really um, be, be treat correctly autistic people and more generally disabled people, you have to challenge the foundations of capitalism, colonialist, imperialist capitalism, which is what this nation state runs on at the moment. Um, so I don't know, that's not a very helpful thing, observation perhaps, for figuring out how we change this because we have to challenge all of capitalism in order to get an autistic conversion therapy banned. Um, 
you know, one other thing that some people have raised, and I think on Kiwi Twitter, uh, it is about how what we think of as good bands, even the LGBTQ, the trans and queer conversion, conversion therapy ban, who is that legislation and that carcerality of that system going to be focused on? You know, um, is this going to be mostly communities of color where people are going to be criminalized for doing conversion therapy, wanting to do the conversion therapy on their kids? Um, so even putting a ban in place legislatively doesn't necessarily solve the problem entirely. Um, Got to be other resources provided uh, for the first, the effective victims. Those are the, the people who were forced to do this conversion therapy should be the people getting the resources first, but also, you know, their families, communities, so that the urge to do it in the first place doesn't happen somehow. I don't know. I think I'm rambling, so I'll just close off my microphone now. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Oh. Many thanks. I think your, your commentary there is uh, spot on. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, so Kim, you're also in Canada, if you want to. Um, AW and I, we've been chatting on Twitter briefly just now, and we just realized that we're both in Toronto. So uh, yeah, um, I feel very similarly to AW, like the NDP has, it has totally let me down. Um, I know some autistic self-advocate activists in the community, uh, one of which is working inside the NDP to try and make change for the benefit of autistic people. And I'd love to connect them with my friend who's doing that activism within the NDP. Me personally, though, I'm in the process of joining the Communist Party. So, but I'm willing to do advocacy within the NDP with my friend Lulu. Fun facts with Lulu on, on Twitter, if, if it helps, if it helps. I'm willing to compromise with social Democrats when it can help people. And yeah, it's absolutely disgusting to hear people who think it's progressive to support ABA. What about like uh, there's there's a prominent leftist in Canada who's my friend um, Andre Demise. Uh, he's very active in the media, and we're friends on Twitter. And uh, the premier of Ontario is a man named Doug Ford. And yeah, Doug Ford is you know absolutely horrible, evil politician, like most politicians, basically. And the one good thing that he's ever done, of course, not with good intentions, but with good effect, was to cut a lot of Ontario provincial funding of ABA. Now, now the supposedly left or center left or progressive media in our area looks at that as he cut autism funding. He doesn't care about, you know, children with autism. Of course, I wouldn't say autistic children. So, and then my, my friend Andre Demise, who is a member of the Communist Party, and otherwise, you know, he has absolutely solid ideas and a, and a very accurate worldview, was citing Doug Ford cutting autism therapy as an example of bad things that Doug Ford has done. And I had to have a private chat with Andre about, no, actually, autistic children were accidentally helped by this right wing politician being stingy. And I had to like give Andre like a stern private talking to I showed him the website of Autistics for Autistics Ontario, which is a local you've heard of it, John It's a local mm -hmm. autistic self advocacy organization here in Ontario, Canada. And I, they do a lot of uh, good research and papers on ABA funding in Ontario and why it's bad. And I showed Andre their website and all the research they've done. And all of a sudden, on you know, enough educate Andre, he he changed course. He was like, oh, oh, I've always heard that you know Doug Ford did something bad by cutting funding to help autistic children, but now. I realize this isn't something that the autistic community wants. And that's another thing, the general public, 
confusing the autism community with the autistic community. They don't even know the difference. And, you know, to, to see non-autistic parents of autistic children and so-called experts always having a seat at the table and we never get a fucking seat at the table. It just it makes me incomprehensibly angry. Like I'm willing to like take a sledgehammer and like wax some shit into little pieces. Sorry, I'm the probably the angriest participant here, but I've made peace with my anger. It's Good there. Time. Well, anger when the topic is so social injustice. So one of the obstacles then, all right, you can go ahead. Whoever wants to talk, please go ahead. I've said what I needed to say. Thank you, okay, Anne. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead then. Um, so one of the obstacles is, I'm just really delayed for my satellite. So that's why I talk over people. Um, but one of the obstacles I think is that all of the services that autistic people want and need cost less than the all the conversion therapy. So we yes, we want certain services and things to happen for us. We want those things to be funded, but it doesn't cost as much. So people are going to be out of work. So they don't want to change because of that, I think. Go ahead, Edeni. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is what, what I describe in general, you know, within our uh, so-called economic system, it actually optimizes for busyness with a Y. And uh, this is one of these fundamental things that is wrong with our society that any kind of random busyness is, is, is seen as, as valuable, uh, which is absurd because this is what uh, causes, I think, increasing levels of, of, of people um, of distress and, and active harm and uh, autistic people amongst those that completely get marginalized in, in the process. Um, Perhaps I'm, I'm, yeah, we are getting close to the hour here. Just um, looking at, uh, I think we've covered part of that question already. But then the next question here, or the last one that we should perhaps uh, briefly talk about is what strategies do we have for, for dealing with existing ABA providers? Can we help to convert some of them to anti ableist thinking, lest they simply go underground? or move to other abusive therapies. This would be part of the transition management. Um, yeah, I think this, we touched on that topic uh, in, in earlier panel discussions. And um, I mean, those, from my perspective, people have been involved in this industry for a long time. Uh, I think from an autistic perspective, it is, would be very difficult for, for me to trust and trust any of these people with, for example, autistic children. Um, so, so there I, I, I see a, a real challenge. Um, and coming back to the framing, I think it's very important that we continue to use this framing of all forms of conversion therapy rather than just ABA. And to point out that uh, what we really concerned about are the objectives, the, the level of blind obedience or conformance to arbitrary authority or, or rules that, uh, that this, these objectives are inhumane. Um, they're not, and they are very detrimental to autistic people. And it doesn't really matter what techniques are used to get towards these goals. Um, so I think this would have implications on suitable framing for any effective legislation. I'm aware that this will not prevent some of these so-called therapies from going underground, but 
at least then from a legal perspective, uh, we uh, are in a, or would be in a position to then uh, identify these things and start doing something about them once we, we identify these things going on. Any, any comments, thoughts? I would rather that these ABA practitioners go underground then. I mean, there's all kinds of underground autism therapies because even the general public realizes that they're bullshit, like chelation, for instance, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, you know, miracle mineral solution and stuff like that. And unfortunately, it still happens. And there are autistic children who are put through chelation and MMS or, and, and all, you know, all kinds of bizarre things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's much better that those practices are shunned by the mainstream, even if we can't completely eliminate it from happening. That being pushed underground makes it happen a lot less frequently. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, accepting that if we push ABA underground, it will still exist underground is something that we're going to have to accept. The victory is making it not acceptable to the mainstream. And I think that it's a, like, I don't know if other people have solved this problem, but in my area, it's a, our state only has less than 2 million people. And there's there's only certain people that are autism players. Um, so I basically know their names, but I can't talk to them. Like I, you know, PTSD from this sort of thing. It's one reason I just can't pick up the phone and talk to them. But also there's there's no forum, there's no place where like the communication channels are just completely closed, even though I've been act, trying to be active in, in this sort of thing for more than 10 years in a fairly small um, state. So I don't even know how, why they would talk to us or how to get them to talk to us. It's a very, I'm very confused. Ah, yeah, thanks, uh, Star, for, for that um, comment, which I think is, is very um, valid and probably applies in other places as well. Um, I think, and that perhaps is a good way to close our discussion today, where uh, in Picking up on what you're just saying about these local challenges that, that can exist, uh, this is where it's we can gain a lot, I think, by collaborating internationally across jurisdictional boundaries or, or within the, the US uh, across states, um, where even if local, uh, if the local access or conversation between activists and uh, politicians is impeded uh, by, and can be impeded by uh, various circumstances that I think it is very powerful uh, if uh, there is visibility of what's going on in other jurisdictions. And so any progress that is made anywhere in the world, I think we can, propagate that uh, and talk about that internationally. Uh, and this uh, then ratchets up pressure. And as we have seen with uh, gay conversion therapies, um, this uh, may then have a catalytic effect and it may enable our progress in other jurisdictions. So that's how I see, uh, yeah, why I, I think it's important to collaborate internationally on this uh, for, from an activist perspective and not just to myopically focus on what's going on locally.
Yes, that sounds good. Phil, any closing words from you? Uh, no, but I'm like, I'm so glad that Jorn, you, you organize things like this. And I'm, I'm so glad for the autistic community. And it's going to take a lot of fighting, a lot of collaboration between us. But, you know, hopefully by the time I'm elderly, we, we will see some societal progress. So thank you very much. Yeah. Star? Uh, any closing words from you? Um, I don't think I have anything else. I just also appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Well, uh, thank all of you, including the, the listeners, the, the viewers, and thanks uh, A.W. Pete uh, for uh, your courage to, to speak up as well. This is great to see, um, as I said in the previous panel, we're only just getting started with this wonderful autistic collaboration project and, and any autistic people who are watching this uh, either now or the recording, you're all welcome to get involved and to contribute your, your lived autistic experience because we not only uh, need to, well, of course, it's very important that we hear from people who are directly exposed to, to ABA from various perspectives, but we also need to hear these other autistic experience like many of ourselves who've been lucky enough never to have suffered uh, ABA being imposed on ourselves. And to uh, perhaps also talk about these alternative life paths that uh, many of us have well, stumbled into. And, and as Kim was saying, I think there's usually those who uh, have carved out a niche somewhere. There's been a lot of luck involved and it's only via, I think, the autistic community that we find the, 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 the strength to, to keep going for, from day to day. Um, so thanks all of you very much. And this is really, it's, it's an autistic, collaboration. I mean, I would be incapable of doing any of this uh, without that wonderful community. So thanks to everyone. And we'll have further discussions. Until Take next care. time. All right. All the best. Bye.